Right, uh, let's start. So, this is the new curriculum. Okay, yeah, we are all here now. Uh, we have to start. Uh, the old curriculum for text was like this could be done. We had two texts like that. This being taxation for taxation of companies and this being taxation of what individuals. That's the old curriculum. Right. And then what they did now in the new curriculum 3701 and 3702 were combined into text 3761. Okay. So now if you are doing 3761, you are doing a year module. You need to attend both the classes for 3701 and the class for 3702. Okay. Are we together there? Yes. So if you are doing the new curriculum, you have to attend both those texts. You have to attend both those texts. Okay, good people. So we are gathering here for 3701 or half of 3761. And we are going to be focusing on taxation of in the uh, taxation of companies. Taxation of companies. Now you will realize this, good people, that in this module there are topics that are going to be studied. And the topics are going to be. We are going to study that. That is going to come with significant marks in the exam. We are going to study, uh, what do we have? We are also going to study that. And then we are going to study gross income. We are going to study exempt income. We are going to study uh, deductions. We are going to study allowances. This is going to be your capital allowances. We are going to study capital gains. Gains tax. We are going to study provisional tax. We are going to study dividend tax. All right, that's our syllabus. Or that's the half of the syllabus of that other uh, year module. That's our syllabus, or that's half of the syllabus or if you are doing the year module. All right, we are moving. So that's the order in which uh, the syllabus goes. That's the order of the syllabus. So we are going to be moving according to that, which is our syllabus. So today we are going to start with our vet. Right, this class is not going to be long. We can, uh, since it's the first day, we can just end at 12 then. But let's do our vet. Our vet, our vet stands for what? Value added checks. Value added 
Now it is levied at 15%. That is after 1 April 2018. It was levied at 14% before 1 April 2018. So when they give you something that was bought, uh, determine when was that thing bought so that you are going to use the correct rate. Okay. So we don't waste time. We go on to say, to talk about uh, output text. We call it output text rather than output vent. Now, when it comes to output text, this is levied on sales. Let me say outbound supplies. Right? So whenever you make a sale, whenever you make an outbound supply, you need to levy output tax and you collect it, your clients, your customers will pay this to you and you collect that and you pay it over to SaaS. So now this one is payable to SaaS. So what is happening is that a company that is selling, if A is going to sell to B, some certain goods, they have to issue an invoice that is going to say cost excluding invest maybe 100 rand, vet 15 rand, total 115. So what will happen is that now, this client will have to pay a total of 115 to this guy who is selling. But this guy, he is collecting the 15 rand VAT on behalf of SARS. He will have to pay it over to SARS as output tax. And he will keep the hundred rand for him. Sharp. Input text now. Input text. This one, it is levied on purchases. In other words, inbound supplies, inbound supply. So when you buy something, you are going to pay input tax. But this input tax that you pay people, you are going to later claim it. This one is claimable from SARS. This company buys and that one is selling. So this guy will pay, remember, he's going to pay. They say the same invoice amount, uh, the cost excluding VAT 100, VAT 15, total 115. This guy is going to pay to that guy 115 because this guy issued an invoice return 115. I want to talk from the perspective of this guy. This guy will go to SARS and say, SARS, I paid VAT of 15 rand and I'm a registered VAT vendor and then he's going to be able to what? To claim the 15 rand. Right, so this is the administration of VAT. That's the administration of VAT. And this guy, this side, is going to what? To pay that 15 rand over to that side. But when we start the good people, whether in accounting or in tax, we are going to only start it from the perspective of one company. Buying and selling, buying and selling. That one company. You are not going to be jumping like a sprinkle to say, what will this company do? What will this company do? No, we are going to look at things from one perspective. Out together. From one perspective. Okay.
Then we move on to the next thing that the students must know are the VET factors. Right. VET factors are the factors that are used to calculate VET. Factors used to calculate VET. Now, the way we calculate VET people, it will depend on whether the amount before us is inclusive of VET or it is exclusive of VET. That's why we have got these two factors. If I'm given an amount that excludes VET, I will say my VET is equal to 15 over 115 times that amount. That amount which is exclude VET. So this is the first factor that we talk about. Scenario number two is in the question, you can be given an amount that includes VET. In the question, you can be given an amount that includes VET. And then they say, couplet for us, the VET. You are going to say, VET, uh -uh, people, why did you leave me to lie? If the amount is good, VET is going to be what? Over 100. So if the amount includes VET, that's when you are going to say 15 over 115 times that amount that includes VET. So that's how it's going to work, good people. Know your VET factors. That's why even in the exam, they will tell you if the amount in question include VET or if the amount in question exclude VET so that you are going to use the correct VET factors. So that you will use the correct VET factors. All right. Okay, so are we, we are done with the factors. This is something that you should already be what? Knowing which you might have had in the streets, but I just had to remind you. All right, so moving on. Living that. Not everyone can live with that could be poisoned. You can only charge that if certain uh, conditions are met. Not everyone can live with that good people, right? You can only live with that under the following circumstances. Let's look at those circumstances. Number one, you must be a vendor. You have said that one must be what? A vet vendor. But the correct word to use there is a vendor. Because a vendor is someone who's registered for vet. So we can't say a vet vendor. It won't be making sense. All right. You must be a vendor. So if you're a vendor, it means that you have got a what? A vet number. You have a vet number. You can charge a vet. If you have a VET number, you can charge VET. And to have a VET number, you must be a VET vendor. To be a VET vendor, you must register. We are going to look at that later. Okay. You must be involved in the what? Supply of goods and services. So you must be involved in the supply of goods and services. This supply of goods and services, it must be in the Republic within South African borders. And finally, it must be in furtherance of an enterprise. It must be in furtherance of an enterprise. Now I have to explain that because that's where 
our vet is going to be. That's the beginning of everything. And that's everything. That's everything that we need to think about. All right. We move on. And now I'm going to start with this one. In the Republic, we are saying that within South African borders, I cannot expand it uh, further than that within South African borders. In furtherance of an enterprise, we are saying that one must be in business. You must be carrying on an enterprise. You must be in business. I am done with that one. That's a simple one. But here are the other requirements now that are going to haunt us in the exam. These two. The next thing is for me to explain them in turn. And as I explain them, make sure that you understand them because you are going to write about them. All right. I'm going to start uh, with uh, vendor. Allow me to use the word vet vendor now. Right. One must register as a vet vendor in order to levy or claim vet. You must register. Now, registration is in terms of what? In terms of section 23 of the VET Act. You register as a VET vendor in terms of section 23 of the VET Act. Now that section 23, it will tell us who can register, it will tell us who cannot register as a vet vendor? I will hear them. All right. Let's learn. Registration as a vet vendor. Right. Section 23 could be for the Vet Act. It says that one can register compulsory registration, or one can register voluntary registration. There are two ways in which we can register as a vet vendor. Right. Right. So the registration can register voluntarily or compulsory. Any question in the exam, they can ask you uh, to discuss if this company can register. You need to consider if can, they can register voluntary or they are required by law to do so. Once it's compulsory, it is now a requirement by the law to do so. I'll hear them. Right, I will start with the uh, compulsory registration. Now, compulsory registration, we are saying that now a, a taxpayer must register compulsory if number one, 
taxable supplies, you will learn about the taxable supplies. Taxable supplies in the last 12 months have exceeded 1 million. If your taxable supplies in the last six months, good people, have exceeded 1 million, you are required in terms of the VET Act to register. You are required in terms of the VET Act to register. You will have no choice in the last 12 months. So at any given time, people to avoid non-compliance, you need to stop and look at your previous taxable supplies in the last 12 months. At each and every month, stop and calculate all your invoices if you're involved in the provision of taxable supplies. If they, the, in the month in which they will exceed 12 months, run to SARS. Sorry, in the, okay, we are saying in the, we are looking at the last 12 months. Set of 12 months, 12 months, determine your taxable supplies. In the month in which they exceed 12, uh, 1 million, you need to run and register. Okay. Or in number two, when expected, when expected taxable supplies, you will learn what are taxable supplies in the next 12 months. In the next 12 months, will exceed 1 million. So, Compulsory registration requires you to do so if your taxes of supply have exceeded what? Uh, have exceeded 1 million. That is, you're looking at the previously, or if the expected, expected, we are looking to, we are looking at the what? At the future. If you expect that your tax of supply is good people will exceed 1 million in the next 12 months, you are going to be required to register compulsory. Now, in this case, good people, we must say that they must what? Sign the contracts. Signed contracts must be in place. You must be able to provide SARS with signed contracts that you have to supply goods that will exceed what? 1 million in the next 12 months. In the next 12 months. Okay. Are we together? Are we together, there, people? Yes, we together. Yes. Okay, so a scenario will come and you have to discuss if someone must register compulsory and they tell you that his previous, uh, what, taxable uh, supplies amounted to maybe the 12 million in the last, 1 million in the last 12 months, they must register. Or they anticipate to supply goods, taxable supplies, you learn what is this taxable supply, that will exceed what? One million. Those people, that person must also register. Now let's go to voluntary registration. Voluntary registration. Voluntary say here yeah, you can choose to register if certain conditions are met. On this side, people, you don't have a choice. You have to register. Non-compliance will lead you to take you to court. Right? Will take you to court. Okay. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Sharp voluntary registration when taxable supplies, a taxpayer may register voluntary. A, a taxpayer may register voluntarily if taxable supplies, taxable supplies 
in the last 12 months have exceeded how much? 50,000. If your tax of supplies we have exceeded 50,000 in the last 12 months, you can go and register voluntarily. But if your tax of supplies do not exceed 50,000 in the last 12 months, and you try to go and register to SARS, SARS is going to say, we are not playing games here. You are not contributing anything to the economy. Your sales are insignificant. Your tax of supplies. All right. So I've explained that to people. You're now in a position to explain to someone uh, whether they should register compulsory or they may choose to register or they cannot register. Now to the main one, supply of goods and services. You need a bigger space. You can uh, write this one. You can make your page. What, what do those people, what do you call it? Portray, what is the landscape? Landscape, like what I've done there. We need to look at the supply of goods and services for people. Supply of goods and services. They are different supplies. And it is this that you need in order to pass. Or rather you need everything. Right, now there are different types of supplies, good people. Some supplies are going to attack that. Some are not going to attack that. Some will attract that at 15%. Some will attract that at 0%. All right. So we first type of supply that we have are referred to as exempt supplies. Now these are listed in section 12 of the VET Act. Now, if we are talking about exempt supplies, we are saying that these supplies, they will not attract VET, hence our right, no VET. All right, I'm willing to give you a whole list of, okay, no, I'll give you the list later. And then we have got these supplies, good people, which we say are taxable supplies. So when determining if one can register as a vet vendor or not, we are going to look at these ones, taxable supplies. Are you involved in the supply of taxable supplies? Now, when it comes to taxable supplies, good people, it means that these uh, supplies are going to attract that either at standard rated supplies, which we call standard rated supplies, these ones will attract VET at what percent? At 15%. And then we have got what we call zero rated supplies. These ones will supply, will attract VET at what percent? At 0%. Now people, you need to understand this diagram because the examiner is going to throw at you a series of, uh, he's going to throw at you a series of, of supplies in which you need to determine if they are standard rated, zero rated, exempt, and do things according to that. Okay, we are moving. We have got deemed supplies. It's not the last one. We are going to have maybe two more there, but my space now is proving to be uh, limited. Now let's talk about deemed supplies. Now, when we say something is deemed, we are likening it to something else. It is not a supply to say, but it shall be treated as a supply. Now, what are these deemed supplies? Number one, we have got ceasing to be a vendor. Ceasing to be a vendor. Ceasing to be a vendor, in other words, you can say in bracket, deregistration as a vet vendor. 
You can register as a private vendor, maybe voluntary. Months down the line, you say, I am no longer interested to be a private vendor. Please, SARS, de register me. You are going to be treated as if you have met a supply. That is going to be uh, referred to as a team supply. Or you get registered as a vet vendor because your tax supplies had exceeded 1 million. And then the following years, the tax supplies now, uh, they've what? They've dropped below a million. So now you can choose if you want to continue as a vet vendor or you can choose to deregister. Someone may opt to deregister. That season to be a vendor and that someone is going to be, to be have to be deemed to have met the supply. We'll look at the nitty gritty for that. Second, we are going to look at indemnity payments. Indemnity payments. Now, what is an indemnity payment? Right. What is an indemnity payment? An indemnity payment, this is a payment that has been received from insurance company for a loss suffered. But I'm going to look at these things in turn because we need to internalize them because you will see them in the exam. All right, we move on. Fringe benefits. Right, fringe benefits, when the company, okay, A fringe benefit now, people, this is a non-monetary benefit that was received from the employer. For instance, you are given the right of use of a company car. You're not given money there, but you've benefited. That's the fringe benefit. The company gives you a computer for private use. It mustn't be for work purposes because it won't be a fringe benefit. For private use, you have benefited there. That's a fringe benefit. So now, those things now, those benefits, if they are granted to you by a company, good people, SARS is going to request the company that is providing those benefits to account for VAT. And it is going to be an output VAT because the company is deemed to have made an outbound supply. All right. Now, people, my space is limited today, but this one, you are going to write it there, right? You're going to write it there, there uh, which is going to be a non supplies. These ones, I can say what they do not trigger VAT. They do not trigger VAT. I don't want to call them exempt. They are not exempt. These supplies are not going to trigger any VAT. They are called non supplies. I have to put them there so that we understand them immediately with other supplies. Now, these are the things, good people. The list is exhaustive. Number one, depreciation. If they list depreciation, say calculate VAT on depreciation, you're going to say it's an unsupply or not an enterprise as defined. Simply say that the marker knows not an enterprise as defined. Right, depreciation, if you see it in the question, you are calculating VAT, simply say not an enterprise as defined. Salaries and wages, not an enterprise as defined. Issue of equity, not an enterprise as defined. That's issue of shares. Okay, we call those a non supply. You have to put them there. We're moving. Another type of supply, it is going to be input tax denied supplies. So people, you are going to use the correct reasoning. If they print something that is exempt, please say it's exempt. If they print something that is standard rated, please calculate. If they print something that is zero rated, please state that is zero rated. If they bring a team to supply, please calculate because those are the treated as supplies per, per se. If they bring something that is a non-supply, please state that 
if they bring something where input text is denied, please state that. So input text is denied on the following things. Entertainment goods. Entertainment goods and services. Input text is denied. Uh, subscriptions, but we are going to qualify this. Subscriptions, you need to be careful. Not all subscriptions, input text will be denied, but we are going to discuss that. Number three, a supply of a motor car is defined. Supply of a motor car is defined. It is going to be what input text shall be denied. Meaning that you won't be able to claim input text. That's what we mean by input text tonight. All right, people. I have covered the majority of the thing. So what I can do here, I will write about these ones, other vet issues. I want you to write this down because that's what we have to talk about uh, in our next class. Other vet issues. We are going to look at uh, purchase of second hand goods from non vendor, purchase of second hand goods from non vendors. We are going to look at importation of goods. Right? We are going to look at fixed property. Fixed property. We are going to look at sale of a coin concern. We are going to look at vet apportionment. We are going to look at change in use. Right, these are the other vet issues that we should look at, but are not covered in that diagram. Remember vet people can take you a whole month. Uh, also, we will look at leasehold improvements. Please keep this information. I may not remember it next time we meet. So it must be handy. After I'm done with my program, it might take us time, but when I'm eventually done, uh, we need to get to this, grind them, do them. It's not like it's a matter of one day, this one's your, take forever. Okay, good people. But at the end of the day, we just need to know these things uh, and that will be it and pass our exams. All right, now back to our diagram. We have listed different types of supplies. Remember our diagram also extends to those ones and to those ones. Now I need to discuss them and make sure that I grill you with these and they stay with you in your head. Exam supplies. Let's look at exam supplies, good people. We have exam supplies here. Uh, we are going to have standard rated supplies there. So now we need to list them. We are going to have zero rated supplies. Now, in the exam, they'll give you a list of supplies and you have to calculate that. Uh, if uh, if uh, an item is exempt, state that is exempt. If it's standard rated, calculate that at 15%. If it's zero rated, calculate VAT at zero percent, but that will take us to a nil VAT. It will take us to a nil VAT there. Are we together, good people? It will take us to a nil VAT. So we definitely, definitely have to understand these things and know them in 
and out. All right. We are moving. Let's see here yeah, something. Can we have some examples there? An example of a standard rated supply. Sorry, exam supply, I'll give you some example. Good people, uh, residential accommodation, residential accommodation, that is your rent where you are staying. Your rent where you are staying, good people, you don't have to account for any output VAT. Sorry, you don't have to claim, you can't claim any input tax there. It is zero rated. It is uh, I didn't send the thing, the code. Four, 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 this one. Okay. In a station accommodation, your rent, good people, because you are paying. You can not claim that, right? Uh, besides that, you are not even sad. That, that. Now, commercial accommodation, uh, we are talking about stays in break and breakfast, we are talking about stays in a hotel. If you are registered at that vendor, you can claim input tax. If you are the one who is supply, supplying that commercial accommodation, you have to charge that. You have to charge that. So we are looking at it from the perspective of the person who is supplying those goods in question and from the perspective of the person who is a, a beneficiary. All right, number two, we are going to say financial services. Financial services, good people. Right, when I say financial services, I am referring to what? Interest paid, interest received, and the issue of what? Issue of loans. I'm not saying bank charges and other funny uh, financial planning services. No, I'm not referring to that. Right? Okay, now normally there is a problem whereby we confuse things. Bank charges, people are standard rated. Bank charges are standard rated. Internet banking fees is standard rated. Banking fees is standard rated. Issue of check, issue of checkbook is standard rated. The bank will have to charge you that. Are we clear there? All right. We move on. Uh, I'm attacking exempt supplies, good people. But if I find that something is uh, closely related to exempt supplies, standard rated, I'll go and put it there. Transportation of passengers by road. Transportation of passengers by road or rail. If you travel by quantum, if you travel by via, you are not going to pay any VAT. You are not going to be charged any VAT. All right. So now here's the interesting thing. On the standard rate today, we are going to say transportation of the passengers transportation of passengers by air to a destination within the public. 
to a destination from within by a within the Republic of South Africa. Within, we are saying that the port of departure is in South Africa, the port of arrival is in South Africa, that is within South Africa, zero, oh, sorry, standard rated. If you buy a ticket now at Oara Temple, they say you're going to, to Devon, they're going to charge you vet. You're traveling by air, you are leaving the Republic to a destination within the Republic. But here's the interesting thing, transportation of passengers, transportation of passengers by air to a destination, to a destination, destination outside the Republic. In other words, this is an export service. It is zero rated, good people. If someone is going to buy a ticket to go to another country, that person is going to be charged with VAT at zero percent if they're traveling by air. Let's move. School fees is zero rated. Ah, oh, sorry, it's exempt. School fees is exempt. Uh, you are not charged. If you look at your invoice there, there is no way where they wrote that at 15%. Right. Here yeah, it is going to be including daycare and preschool. All right, we move. Okay. Uh, standard rated. Now, in most cases, good people, in most cases, you consider if something is exempt or zero rated, otherwise it will fit in there. Okay. That's how you do it. All right, white bread. White bread is here, good people. A brown bread is there. Right. Basic foodstuffs, zero rated. Basic foodstuff, zero rated. So, what do I mean by those basic foodstuffs? You can write them down. We are talking about milk, we are talking about meat, we are talking about fish, we are talking about mealy meal. Those are basic foodstuffs. We are talking about same. We are giving that list now on what? On, on zero rated. Those goods are zero rated, good people. Right. Now allow me to say uh, subscriptions. to trade unions or employee unions. It is there. Now when it comes to uh, subscriptions, good people, it is very tricky. Some subscription will have uh, some funny stuff, but we'll look at that one later. All right. Let me add here. exports, direct exports, direct exports, indirect exports there. Right, so we know the difference between direct exports and indirect exports. Right, direct exports it works like this. We have a company here in the Republic, Republic of South Africa. And this is Botswana or a foreign country. They ship these goods straight to Botswana. That is a direct export. It is going to be zero rated. Now, here is the issue about indirect exports. 
This is your Republic of South Africa. Here's the thing about indirect exports. Indirect exports, you say that now, a non-resident is going to come into South Africa here and maybe buy goods from ShopRite and buy goods from ShopRite there. This is the person, he came here in the Republic. So the transition between the ShopRite and that non-resident there, it is going to be standard rated. But when this person now, if he's going to take this good with him back to his country, he will have to present the receipts there at the point of exit in order for him to say, now these goods that you charge me that at that stage, I'm now taking them with me. I'm now exporting them to my country. Thereafter, they will refund you. They will pay back your vet. So be careful there. They will tell you that someone came from Botswana to have this computer fixed here in the Republic. And he was charged an invoice. It should that invoice be standard rated or zero rated? You have to state that at the time that he's paying the service provider, the service provider will have to charge VAT. But if this person is going to take the computer with him out of the Republic, at the point of exit, you will have to claim the VAT. All right. Yeah, good people, we've got fuel. Diesel, petrol, paraffin, zero rated. Okay. And keep this list open. I hope you wrote it in a fresh page. Whenever I come here and I remember that there's something that I did not uh, mention, whether it's standard rated or zero rated, I'll add it. Otherwise, people, all other things are going to be standard rated there. At time, the list of standard rated, it is what I cannot exhaust it. At time, uh, any other thing that you bought this morning, if you realize, if you look at your invoice there, if you look at the receipt, if that was calculated at 15%, that item is standard rated. If they put a star and they went on to say zero rated at the bottom there, that item is zero rated, you come and add it there. So make sure that now from today onwards, when you buy something from the shop, look at the receipt. If that is calculated at 15%, go and write that item here. If they put a star and then at the bottom, they said zero rated, go and put that item there. If they said it's an exam supply, go and put that particular item there. All right. So I'm done there, I'm done there, I'm done there. Let me talk about deemed supplies. Deemed supplies. Team to supplies, right? For team to supplies, it's a whole lot of things there. And there are some calculations that need to be done. So, right. Team to supply, number one. Season to be a vendor. Here we say output tax, output tax payable on goods and goods. We are referring to assets and rights. Now, this is what's going to happen, good people. When you are ceasing to be a vendor, SARS is going to say, uh, bring your statement of financial position. For each and every item that is sitting on the statement of financial position there, we are going, we are going to what? to calculate output tax. Now this output tax, output tax shall be based on the lower of cost, how much you bought those goods for, including that, and, but they say all there, or open market value. 
open market there. So it means that now if a supplier is a company in question is going to be seizing to be a vendor good people, you need to identify the assets that they own and you shall calculate that on those assets. And the VAT so calculated, which is going to be out of VAT, it is going to be based on the lower of cost, including VAT and the open market value. The open market value they are going to be giving us in the question. Right. Okay, so you do the calculation of output tax could be. But if with the item in question, if the goods in question, if the asset in question could be for the company was not able to claim input tax, we are not going to calculate output tax on it. It would be fair to SARS and everyone. Right? It'd be fair to SARS and everyone. Okay, so that's season to be a vendor. In terms of our income tax, the section 82. Uh, this is what you would do there. Right. We go to another one indemnity payment. Indemnity payment this is a payment received from the insurance company, from the insurance company for the loss suffered. Right, now when it comes to indemnity people, indemnity is in two forms. Okay, before that, I would say that now, this is a deemed supply, deemed supply, by the recipient. Therefore, it means that the recipient, the recipient will have to account for output tax. The person who is receiving the indemnity payment is the one who is supposed to account for output tax on the amount received. Amount received. Okay. Right. But now our indemnity payment works like this for people. If it's uh, one of your assets in short, and then you suffer the mishap, either the asset is stolen or either the asset is destroyed, the insurance company will have to indemnify you, right? And there are two ways in which you can be indemnified. We have to look at that, right? We have to look at that. Let's look at indemnity because there are different vet consequences. Indemnity works like this. The company can replace the item stolen or damaged, or the company may make what? A payment, the insurance company. So an item is insured, a mishap is suffered, a loss is suffered, the insurance company can do one of the following. Now, if they are going to replace No VET consequences. If there's going to be a replacement, no VET consequences. But if the company is going to, if the insurance company is going to make a payment to you for the loss suffered, we are going to say VET at 15 over 115 of the amount received. Fifteen over one one five of the amount received. Are we together? Are we clear there, people? 
Yes. Yes. All right, uh, we move on. So be careful, good people, read your question careful and find out whether there was a replacement or there was a payment. If there was a payment, you have to account for output tax. This is section 88, good people there. Are we clear? Yes, right. you find it there. All right, so, and then we have got fringe benefits. Is the last deemed supplied. Right, uh, when it comes to fringe benefits, I can say number one, fringe benefits other than, other than the right of use of a common car, other than the right of use of a company car. Uh, now those fringe benefits could be for, in most cases, it is going to be, maybe you are given an asset. We are going to say now, output tax, output tax, uh, calculated, calculated on the value of the benefit. Remember, fringe benefits are non-monetary. Uh, them being non-monetary, we are going to work out our output tax on the monetary equivalent. So you are going to learn how to calculate the monetary equivalent of a fringe benefit. Right, so now the fringe benefits that we are going to have here for people, are going to be the following. One, we can have uh, like assets acquired by assets acquired by an employee from an employer. So now let me say this, that you can write on top there that uh, calculating value of the benefit Calculating value of the benefit. We need to have this value of the benefit first before we can do our calculations. Now, our fringe benefits, other than the right of use of a company car, it could be whereby you are given an asset by a company. In that case, we are going to say 1.1, we focus on the following. If the asset was acquired, asset acquired, specifically for the employee, specifically for the employee. In this case, your company went out to buy you an asset and they give it to you. It could be a cell phone, it could be a, uh, it could be a computer, but those things are given to you must be used mainly for private use for us to say it's a fringe benefit. If they are given to you for work purposes, mainly for work purposes, we say they're not a fringe benefit. Now here, the value of the benefit that we are going to base our vet on, value of the benefit, it is going to be equal to the what? To the cost of acquiring that asset. Cost of acquiring the asset by the employer. Right, if there's any consideration that you're going to pay, we say let's start consideration. That's scenario number one. Scenario number two, we say that the asset acquired, asset acquired was previously used, previously used by the employer or in the employer's business. In other words, this asset so acquired with people, you are acquiring it second hand. Maybe you saw a computer in one of the offices there that is no longer in use. You ask your boss, can I take it home? If they agree, then that's a fringe benefit has been triggered there. And this is how we are going to calculate the value of that fringe benefit. Value of the benefit 
the value of the benefit, we are going to say it is going to be the market value of that asset, market value of the asset. Our output VAT is going to be based on the market value of that asset at the time you acquired it. Market value. All right. Another scenario, good people, it could be whereby you are given what? Invent of your employer then. You can say asset acquired constitute invent. If the asset so acquired good people is going to constitute invent, the value of the benefit, the value of the benefit will be equal to the lower of cost or open market value. It's going to be the law of the two shall be deemed to be the benefit. So as you can see, yes, like we still apply our eyes to in determining our benefit. All right. Uh, so we are done with the acquisition of asset, acquisition of assets. That's number one. Now, what about when you have got number two, which is the right of use of an asset? Right of use of an asset. This time you are not given the asset, it's not yours, but you are given the right to use it. Right, so the value of the benefit, value of the benefit is going to be calculated as 15% per month multiplied by the lower of cost or open market value. Oh, not per month, but per year, per annum. Per annum. Multiply by the law of cost or open market value. All right, that becomes the value of the fringe benefit on which you are going then to calculate your output tax. Now, the right of use number three is going to be done next week or that other week, right of use of a company car, company vehicle. We are going to look at that one, but uh, you don't have to write that one now. Uh, okay, putting it aside, I forgot to tell you how you calculate the benefit here. So now, uh, steps in calculating a output tax, output tax on a fringe benefit. We did the calculation of those values for a purpose. Step number one, determine the value of the benefit, excluding that. Excluding that. You now know how to calculate the value of the benefit depending on whether the asset was given under what circumstances. So, step number two, you simply have to calculate output tax using factor 15 over 115. This is where it gets tricky. It gets tricky because. In step number one, you determined the value of the benefit, excluding VAT. Step number two, you are now calculating your VAT on that value of the fringe benefit. That value of the fringe benefit, it is already excluding VAT, but the VAT factor that we are going to use, it is 15 over 115. That's how it's done for people. It might be look like it's defying logic, but for whatever reasons, SARS deemed it fit that the VAT on the fringe benefit, we should calculate it that way. All right. So that other week, we are going to look at the right of use of a company car. 
Now, company vehicle, let me use vehicle. Fringe benefit, it's a fringe benefit also, right? Uh, if I get some time there, I'm going to send you the steps. Then when we meet after Easter, I'll explain to you each and every step. And we are also going to do some exercises. All right, so this is what we are going to do next week. And then we also look at input text tonight. You remind me, good people. And then also, remember I said, you must keep this list now. It is going to guide me as to where do I go from here. I need that list. I need that uh, list, the good people. I need that list. Oh, let me export the PDF to, to, to myself. That list, I will need it. I'm going to share this PDF also. All right, people, uh, for today, let's end it here. Like I said, that is going to be a short class. Let's end it here. I'm also going to share the video with you guys. So let's go and study what we have done so far and make sure that we internalize it. And make sure that we internalize it. All right. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All thank right. You. Uh,